us. <laughs> yes. Great. And um, I'll mention that I'm using automatic captions and hopefully hopefully my my kids have just figured out how to actually jump the gate that comes up to the stairs. So hopefully we won't hear too much interference being caught up in the captions. If so, if it gets really distracting, I can turn it off. Um, but yeah, working in, in uh, COVID times, everybody's in this unusual situation for everybody. Oh. And I want to start with... They're pretty good, oh, actually. Go ahead. Was there a question? I'm sorry, I unmuted my microphone on accident. Okay, no worries. Yeah, feel free if you have if you have a question throughout. I mean, I'll I'll definitely leave time for questions at the end. Um, but feel free to use the chat. I mean, I've got some slides prepared because I've given a lot of talks on this. But you know, I'm more interested in in perhaps having a discussion and happy to kind of direct this in whichever way people are interested in. So you know, feel free to interrupt and ask questions and you know either raise your hand or unmute yourself and use the chat as well. But I'm going to start with a land acknowledgement. So truth and acknowledgement are critical to building mutual respect and connection across all barriers of heritage and difference. We begin this effort to acknowledge what has been buried by honoring the truth. University of Wisconsin-Madison occupies ancestral Ho-Chunk land, a place their nation has called the Jope since time immemorial. The Ho-Chunk were forced to feed, cede this territory in 1832. We commit to acknowledge the painful history of genocide and forced removal from this and all territories. We commit to honor and respect the many indigenous people still connected to the land and waters on which we gather remotely. Please take a moment to consider the many legacies of violence, displacement, migration, and settlement that connect us together today. Um, and if you're not in Madison and you know the names of the territories where you're joining us, feel free to use the chat to acknowledge those um, as well. So we start a lot of our, well, we start our workshops and presentations with and land acknowledgement, um, you know, for several reasons. It, you know, we're trying to recognize the colonial and racist history of our, of our disciplines in our society, and this is one way to do that. Um, a lot of the work that my team and I have focused on is on um, you know, violence in, in STEM, um, especially starting with sexual violence and native and indigenous women in the US and in the world experience some of the greatest rates of sexual violence. Um, and you know, it affects our, our campus community um, as well. And then when we think about you know, diversity in academia, diversity in the science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and medicine, the STEM disciplines, uh, Native and indigenous people are some of the least represented, not just, you know, um, they're not even single digits in percentages, they're single digits in numbers uh, sometimes. So something to recognize um, as well. And so usually, Having a hard time advancing. Usually, okay, here we go. Um, and so, usually, I, you know, most of most of my research is on soil biogeochemistry. I'm trained as a biologist, ecologist, soil scientist, um, and I consider myself a geographer and a geoscientist. I'm, you know, very interdisciplinary in my training and in my interests. I like to joke that I have a hard time focusing on just one thing. So I've figured out how to connect everything that I'm interested in. Um, and so, you know, usually I do a lot of work on kind of carbon cycling and land use change and climate and how that affects biodiversity and, and biogeochemical cycles or nutrient cycling. But more recently, I've actually taken some of the advocacy work for increasing equity in STEM that I've been doing kind of on the side. I've taken that into kind of my mainstream research um, as well. And so currently, I'm actually the lead principal investigator of a large grant funded by the National Science Foundation um, to improve workplace climate in the geosciences, but we've actually been expanding to other disciplines. And I think a lot of what we're gonna talk about today, you know, some of the data I'll show you is, is relevant, you know, or it comes from the geosciences, but I think you'll see that it's relevant for 
you know, not only other STEM disciplines, but also outside of, of STEM disciplines as well. We have some of the same challenges. They might manifest in different ways, but ultimately some of the same challenges. So our project is called the Advanced Geo Partnership. Um, and we're working in the geosciences because it's one of the least diverse fields in STEM uh, and we're collecting data on people's experiences. Uh, we, the project started focusing on sexual harassment, but we very quickly brought in to think about hostile climates more broadly. So including other types of harassment, bullying, um, and exclusionary behaviors that people experience. And so I think historically a lot of the work that has been done um, you know, and including funded by the National Science Foundation, focusing on diversity and equity in STEM has focused on, let's get more people interested in science, right? Let's think about recruitment, give them opportunities to be, to know that these disciplines exist and opportunities to enter the discipline. And now we're realizing that that's not necessarily, right? In some places, people might not have access, um, absolutely. But really the problem is retention. And really the problem is thinking about, you know, what are, what are the spaces that we're trying to recruit into? If those spaces are hostile, then we're not gonna have people stay. And so that's what we've been uh, focusing on. So we've been developing kind of bystander intervention education with scenarios that are specific to STEM disciplines, you know, that happen in the lab, in the field, at conferences, and that incorporate intersectionality. Uh, we were developing teaching modules that identify harassment as research misconduct. And I think one of the really neat aspects of our project is that it actually rose from a collaboration among um, scientific societies and peer mentoring networks in the community, um, the Earth Science Women's Network that um, I was recently on the board of, the Association for Women Geoscientists, and then the American Geophysical Union, which is the world's like largest earth and space science uh, society. Um, and that's actually, you know, that kind of platform of collaborating with non-academic uh, organizations has given us um, access to much broader audience, um, you know, has given us really a national kind of platform in a way, but also um, has allowed us to come, to come up with, you know, innovative policies um, to try to change the culture of the discipline um, and, you know, from the outside, try to change academic uh, culture. Um, as, as you all know, <laughs> working for the TAA, academic institutions are very slow, conservative, bureaucratic animals. And so trying to figure out, you know, other ways of changing organizations and the culture um, can be really useful. So I just wanted to point you um, to our website. Um, if you Google Advanced Geo CERC, CERC is a science education research center um, out of Carleton College, which is like a um, nationally renowned hub of science education materials for all disciplines. Um, but they've got some great resources for the geosciences, but you'll find our, our website there. And one of the things that we've spent a lot of time on is developing these community resources, because we, we recognize that as scientists, um, you know, unless we've kind of actively sought some of this information, some of this research out, um, you know, we're not necessarily exposed to, you know, what social, you know, sociology, we're not exposed to like race and ethnicity studies, we're not exposed to like, you know, gender and, and women's studies uh, research um, that can be, you know, so important and kind of give giving a name to experiences that we're having in scientific disciplines and actually thinking about some of the strategies. And so um, this website has, you know, as you can see, a long list of different resources written for scientists, um, you know, to kind of help start some of these conversations and start finding some solutions to some of the, of the challenges. And so, you know, kind of a big driver um, behind this work and, you know, on, especially on the side of the National Science Foundation is, you know, that our STEM workforce nationally does not reflect our society, right? There's a lot of groups that are grossly underrepresented. Um, and even in some group, you know, some disciplines like biology, um, you know, where women actually make up the majority of students, if you start looking at some of the, you know, some of the other levels, if you start looking at faculty, you start looking at leadership, you start getting really small numbers. So, you know, still uh, gender disparities. And then of course, if you look at other 
identities, right? Race and ethnicity are grossly underrepresented, even in disciplines that we think of being typically very diverse, like biology. So 1% of ecology and evolutionary biology PhD graduates in the US are black, really low numbers. And then, you know, as I mentioned, less than single digit percentages for Native American or Alaska uh, Native. And this is, you know, this is, you know, we see this across disciplines. And now these are some historical disciplines of, you know, scientists in a lab um, on the top looking through some microscopes. And then the picture on the bottom is, is of um, a United States, right, a U.S. Geological Survey expedition uh, in the 1800s. But honestly, a lot of our departments, you know, still look like this, right? Different clothes, <laughs> pictures are in color but we still have some of these legacies um, of, you know, of exclusion, very palpable and um, you know, prevalent across STEM, but also across a lot of the humanities and social sciences um, as well. And so I have some data. I don't wanna to spend too much time on data. I'd rather focus on, um, on some of the strategies, but you know, very low percentages of representation you know across different levels for women but especially women of color in the geosciences which is the field that we've been focused on and um, actually some recent grad students uh, came out with a paper in nature geoscience a couple of years ago and they looked at the data of phd degrees awarded um, you know in the earth um, space atmospheric and oceanic sciences broadly defined as the geosciences um, by race and ethnicity and found actually no progress in the in graduations, right? And PhDs awarded to different, you know, non-white race and ethnicity groups. So obviously, a lot of work that's been put into recruitment and diversity efforts in the last couple of decades is not um, is not paying off. So that's why we're kind of focusing more on more on the workplace climate than the recruitment. Um, I want to uh, also make a shout out. You know, this week is Black in Geoscience Week. If you're on Twitter. Um, the summer has been incredible. Almost every other week has been a black in chemistry, black in nature, um, you know, black in biology, black in engineering. Uh, well, it's it's our week this week, um, and so you know, there's a lot of it's been incredible to just see actually um, and you know meet black geoscientists from across the U.S. and across the world, hear about what they're doing, and also hear some of their stories. Um, of exclusion in the field as well. It's a really important kind of, you know, really important moment, but a really important learning opportunity for everybody. And I have a quote here um, from a recent um, article that came out in Nature, Ecology and Evolution, um, you know, just to kind of highlight some of the challenges that people of color experience really daily um, in some of our disciplines. So being the only Black Indigenous, person of color, day in and day out is exhausting and corrosive. Your colleagues will not understand things that routinely happen to you. For example, police interrogations at field sites, being overlooked at conferences, assumptions that you hold a less skilled position, overly personal questions about your appearance. And just yesterday, somebody um, shared through the Black in Geoscience, um, you know, um, hashtag, you know, she, as, a, as a Native Hawaiian scholar, you know, arriving at a hotel for an award ceremony where she was a recipient of an award and, you know, and her host assuming that she was the help, right? So thinking about, you know, the impact of those experiences, those assumptions, those, you know, honestly racist experiences that people, um, you know, people are living, you know, daily, day to day, and also in, in even in moments where you're being recognized as a scholar. And so there's been uh, more, more work recently um, being done on kind of identifying um, hostile workplaces. Um, and so thinking about, you know, some of the numbers, um, and I just want to throw out a little bit of data out here. Um, usually I'm talking to scientists and they don't believe this is a problem unless you show them data and they don't believe it's a problem unless you show them data for their particular subdiscipline. Um, so we've actually developed a workplace climate survey for the geosciences with psychologists where we'll be able to show them the data for your discipline. This is happening to you and well, to your colleagues. Um, but 
a survey came out of the um, you know, LGBT plus physics community showing that gender nonconforming and LGBT plus cisgender women experience three to two times more exclusionary behaviors than male LGBT plus, right? So we start seeing this disproportionate impact based on um, people's identities and, and multiple marginalized identities. A survey from the astronomy astrophysics community revealed 40% of women of color um, compared to 27% of white women feeling unsafe due to their gender, 28% of women of color feeling unsafe due to their race. Um, and then this is leading, you know, women of color, white women, other underrepresented groups in science to actually skip out on professional events, not go to conferences, not go to class, not go to the field, right? So we're starting to see these professional repercussions, um, you know, and repercussions to the field of, of these exclusionary experiences. And um, we've done a lot of work also on kind of compiling data and, and you know, communicating this data to scientists about um, you know, the prevalence of sexual harassment on you know, university campuses and research labs at conferences and field environments. Um, you know, also thinking about kind of all other types of mistreat mistreatment um, and recently I've been a lot of attention also on bullying. And so I just wanted to show some data here, you know, for the United States. And actually, if you, if you Google, you know, kind of bullying, um, you know, most of the definitions, most of the research, most of the attention is focused on schools and school children. But the fact is that, you know, adults across the world, and especially in the United States, experience a lot of bullying. So 62% of higher ed employees, so this is in, right, in universities, reported witnessing or experiencing bullying in the past 18 months. And this is compared to 50% for overall American workplace. So there's been a lot of research trying to figure out, you know, are, are higher ed institutions unique? You know, how are they similar to what people are experiencing outside, but also how are they, um, how and why are they unique? And, and how does that help us um, design you know, interventions and strategies. And then 90% of American workers experience bullying over their lifetime. So, you know, these are some pretty sobering uh, numbers. And one thing we like to focus on um, in a lot of the work that we're doing, um, you know, is that hostile behaviors do not have to be illegal to be harmful, right? So often a lot of the strategies, you know, that institutions uh, implement, um, are focused on kind of like following, you know, is this illegal or not, right? Like following kind of legal processes. And the truth is that, you know, exclusionary behaviors, right, do not have to, you know, rise to the level of being legally defined as to have really harmful consequences. And so we should be, you know, we, sh we should be dealing with all of these, um, you know, and preventing them and stopping them and, you know, creating a no tolerance culture um, right, and they can even be deadly, as, as obviously uh, we know, right, through thinking about the Black Lives Matter movement, say her name, um, and some of the, the experiences of, of people trying to enjoy nature and scientists enjoying nature, um, and how they, you know, their, their lives can be at risk. So there's been a lot of research on kind of the consequences of these types of behaviors, you know, they, you know, there's a lot of conversations about racial trauma, right? Um, you know, but all of these experiences create trauma, they create psychological harms, physiological harms. Um, and of course, you know, they affect people's, you know, people's feelings of safety in the workplace, they affect people's productivity, they affect access to opportunities, they affect, you know, kind of um, morale of universities, right? They affect this um, trust and leadership. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's important to focus on these behaviors, you know, even if the, even if the, if the harm was just at the individual level, they're important enough. But I, you know, I think it's important to show that, you know, kind of targeting and exclusionary behaviors in the, targeting one individual actually has ramifications through all levels of our community, right? And in as much as people are experiencing these exclusionary behaviors and not participating in academia, they're not participating in STEM, they're not participating in a workplace, you know, then they're not contributing, you know, their intellectual contributions um, to the field as well. So it weakens the academic enterprise. So those are problems, which of course everybody's already identified. 
Um, you know, and we like to say we treat our data better than our people um, and we need to change this. And so what are some, you know, different strategies that can be taken? And I'm just going to give, you know, I can talk about this all day happily for days, um, but I just want to give you kind of an idea of, of some of the things that we've been focusing on and some of the things um, that we could talk about and then, and then, you know, hopefully not talk too much more so that we have time for, for questions and I can, you know, talk in a little bit more detail about some of these if people are interested. But there's, um, as I mentioned earlier, things don't have to be illegal to be harmful. And so just relying on legal compliance is not useful in that way. But even things that are, are illegal, you know, we're recognizing that, um, you know, the National Academies of Sciences came out with a report two summers ago on sexual harassment and recognizing that we can't rely on the legal system to address things that are illegal. Uh, we need to really focus on addressing workplace culture and climate because the legal system is not working right now. So there's a lot of things we can do as individuals and a lot of our work focuses on kind of the individual level and, and um, you know, getting people who don't typically experience these things or even those who do experience it. Actually, a lot of people, you know, won't, won't even you know, you can actually, if you put out a survey, you know, something I learned by, by working with psychologists and sociologists, you can ask someone if, you know, have you been sexually harassed? Because, you know, a lot of people will say no, but then if you ask them, have you experienced this? They'll say yes. They're like, well, that's sexual harassment, right? But we often, you know, or even people who, you know, experience a microaggression, there's a lot of like, you know, was that a microaggression, right? So there's a lot of just even self-education to identify these behaviors and recognize, no, these are harmful behaviors. These are not okay, right? These are not acceptable. Um, also encouraging dialogue, right? So having conversations about this with your, with your teams, with your departments, um, you know, at the university level with our communities is really important to kind of shine the light. And that's something that, right, the scholar strike and teaching and teachings are trying to do um, as well. And then also, you know, thinking about what can we do to to be a role model, like how, you know, think about how am I treating other people um, and how can I support people who are affected by these type of behaviors and ultimately demand accountability of ourselves, of our peers, of our leadership, um, you know, and obviously, you know, uh, a lot of grad students think they don't have a lot of power. As the TAA, you know you have a lot of power. Um, so, you know, you can definitely demand accountability uh, for good behavior um, and then speak out you know, when you see something or hear about something that's not acceptable. Um, I want to point out, um, you know, I'll talk about resources that you can do at all different levels. Um, you know, one of our colleagues, Asmarina Safao Berhe, is a co-principal investigator on the advanced grant that I'm working on. Um, she's also a good friend from grad school. So start building your communities early on to make change in your, uh, in your disciplines and beyond. But um, she and Bala Chaudhari came out with um, a paper um, that's, you know, public, it's accessible online. Um, you know, they have 10 simple rules for building an anti-racist lab. And this is, you know, a great resource. I know a lot of research labs, research groups across the country are sitting down you know, with, with their members and kind of going through these and talking about, you know, what can we do, you know, as a small community, because sometimes you can feel overwhelmed, like, you know, I can't change the institution, right, I can't change the discipline, but there's a lot you can do, I would say you can, but it can be overwhelming, but there's a lot of stuff you can do just within, you know, within your small uh, community. So that's a great resources that resource that I wanted um, to make sure everybody was uh, aware of. And if you just Google 10 simple rules for building an anti-racist lab, uh, you'll come up with it. Um, we've been doing a lot of work with professional um, associations. And so, um, you know, we've been working for the last, well, I mean, 10 years really, but focusing on, on these issues, specifically on, of harassment and hostile climates for maybe the last five years. Um, with the American Geophysical Union, and they were one of the, the first, if not the first, society to come out and um, actually explicitly define discrimination, harassment, and, and bullying as scientific misconduct. And so any of you who might have taken kind of a research ethics class, um, you know, those, right, the definition of research misconduct usually focuses on data, right? We treat data better than our people. It focuses on plagiarism. You know, NAGU had a really good code of conduct 
that focused on, you know, they have their own journals. So there was a lot about, you know, plagiarism. There's a lot about, you know, you know, mismanagement of funds, right? Kind of like the, <laughs> the research, the traditional research component of it. Um, and not so much about how we treat people. And so that was actually, it's a really different way of thinking about um, scientific misconduct. And so AGU's code of conduct has now become like a role model for societies, you know, across disciplines. Um, we've actually done a lot of work with, con with societies in, you know, in sociology thinking about how do we, you know, how can they adapt some of these, um, you know, some of this policy and in, in some of the practices into what they're doing um, as well. And so, you know, AGU has already rescinded a top scientific award because somebody violated, you know, their code of ethics in terms of how they treated people, right? That's, that's you know, it'd be nice to be able to bring this to university campuses as well. And, and we know that departments, you know, across the country in geosciences are actually, you know, adopting AGU's, um, you know, ethics policy as kind of guiding principles for how they're going to behave, you know, as a small community within an, an institution. Um, and so there's a lot you can do actually as early career researchers working with your professional society. So look for, you know, there's a lot of leadership um, opportunities for be able to kind of influence um, from the outside institutions uh, as well. Um, in the geosciences, um, you know, one of the founders of Black and Geoscience Week, Dr. Hendrata Ali, actually started this, um, you know, and colleagues started this uh, petition for geoscience society specifically for an anti-racism plan and has, you know, a number of points, um, you know, demanding, you know, taking advantage of the role that professional societies um, have in terms of kind of setting Right, setting the standard for for you know what it means to be a disciplinary scientist um, and being kind of a role model in terms of of kind of community standards as well. So you can see that's that's excitingly um, has more than twenty five thousand signatures, and I know that a lot you know a lot of you come from different disciplines, and in your disciplines, your societies are probably doing some of the same um, as well. Um, funding agencies are starting to pay attention to these things. Um, they've started with sexual harassment in the last couple of years. Obviously, that's been in the news. So the National Science Foundation has a new policy on sexual harassment that requires institutional reporting of investigations. We can talk about problems um, with that, but at least they're recognizing right, that they probably shouldn't keep funding people who have known histories right, um, of and especially documented histories of sexual harassment. Um, and so, you know, we've, we gave a presentation to NSF and, and said, you know, that's great, but you actually need to kind of adopt a similar policy to AGU that's not just focused on sexual harassment, but also, you know, kind of thinking about bullying and racism and other exclusionary behaviors. Um, and also, you know, provide support for people whose careers have been curtailed by hostile climates, because we know that this leads to right, leads to people leaving the field um, who might otherwise not have wanted to. So how can we, you know, how can we support them and bring them back if they want to? Um, so a few different things we can do. Um, there's been a lot of work recently on, on kind of recognizing the history of, um, you know, racist and colonial history of our disciplines. And, you know, those of you who might be in kind of the history of science and science and technology studies are like, well, obviously, um, but most scientists don't get exposed to this, right, during their regular training as, as scientists. So really important to think about how our current institutional structures, practices, and behaviors continue, right, to exclude the people that they were actually built to exclude. Um, a lot of our, you know, a lot of our academic institutions really haven't changed that much, even though we've opened the doors to let more people in, but um, there haven't been that many changes. So, you know, thinking about broadly redesigning science education, right? To think about, you know, opening our minds, recognizing these, uh, these histories. And there's been a lot of work on, um, you know, kind of, you know, decolonizing. And I know, I know that term can be problematic, so I'm using the quotes, but, you know, decolonizing science reading lists. Um, and Dr. Chanda Prescott-Weinstein was one of the first to kind of publicly, from the science side, 
um, kind of create, curate this on this awesome resource that's still uh, available. Um, acknowledge science is political, um, you know, science is a pursuit of knowledge, knowledge is power and power is politics, um, you know, for, for scientists, this is not something that, that always sits very well. It's not easily digestible, but we obviously need to recognize it. And really important, um, disincentivize unethical uh, behavior. So there's a lot of, you know, our current systems of um, evaluation of promotion, you know, um, decompartment, right, compartmentalize and kind of isolate people's you know, scientific or research productivity from their impact on their people impact um, on the community around them. And, you know, in some ways you could argue that our current reward system actually incentivizes these types of behaviors. And so we need to kind of, you know, transform these and uh, rethink these. There's been research on, kind of, you know, sexual harassers in academia and finding that some of them have you know, decades long histories from institution to institutions, right, with no, um, you know, really with, with no sanctions. So our universities need to, to really think about how we're, you know, our systems might be directly and indirectly incentivizing unethical behavior. Um, there's been a lot of conversation recently on reinventing mentoring and how um, traditional mentoring models are really hierarchical, right, and, and you know, create this potential um, and not just potential but actualized uh, power, power uh, imbalances and abuses of power right and I wanted to um, in, you know in case you weren't aware but the National Academy of Sciences came out with a new report last fall um, that summarizes you know all the research on effective mentorship in STEM and has some really good recommendations and some of that might also be some interesting reading to have you know, at your, at your research group level or at the departmental level as well. So there's been a lot of focus now on kind of research mentor teams, right? And kind of, you know, delinking research funding, you know, in STEM specifically from, from, from advisors, right? To kind of build in a little bit more uh, independence and in, in less, um, you know, less potential for abuses of power. So as you can see, there's a lot of different, different levels um, at which we can tackle some of these problems. Um, one of the things we've been spending a lot of time on is thinking about, um, you know, acknowledging that these hostile behaviors, you know, fall under the definition of research misconduct and that they also fund, fall under the definition of like research safety. You know, if you're in a lab and, you know, somebody is saying racist things to you, you feel unsafe, right? You, you're not gonna be able to pay as much attention to the chemicals that you're working with, right? So ultimately it's really a lab safety issue. If you're doing field research, um, you know, there's been a lot of attention research, recently on kind of, you know, how exclusionary behaviors have, you know, people's, I, I, you know, people's identity can make them really vulnerable in different field research environments. That's a safety issue. So we need to really be, thinking about that, um, you know, at, at that level um, as well. And so these are some great two articles that came out recently, one in science, um, you know, kind of really highlighting how prejudice and racism can make fieldwork dangerous for African American scientists and, um, you know, and, you know, transphobia, homophobia, right, sexism, misogyny can make research environments, um, you know, unsafe for other identities um, as well. And then a, rec a recent survey just came out actually um, last week, um, you know, thinking about specific challenges that LGBTQ plus um, people experience doing field work, right? And field work, you know, field work doesn't have to be out in the rocks, right, with a hammer, which is our stereotype of geologists, but, you know, even social scientists, you know, go out I mean, and do field work, um, you know, humanities, uh, researchers can also go out and do field work in archives and interviewing people as well. So we can think of field work more broadly and thinking about how these exclusionary behaviors create unsafe environments, you know, for all sorts uh, of people. And, you know, ultimately thinking about who is doing this, all of this work, right? There's a lot of work um, in recognizing and compensating, you know, this labor. 
And finally, thinking about, you know, especially in academia, right, like, how do we redefine success? Um, you know, how do we, you know, so often we have this, this false tension, but um, it's false in that I don't, I don't believe it's, a, you know, I don't, I don't believe it's a legitimate tension, but it's very real in that it's, you know, it affects you know, it operates, it's very alive and well of this tension between kind of diversity and equity and excellence, right? Um, and we need to have really serious conversations about how, you know, that's really illegitimate <laughs> um, and thinking about how do we rebuild um, our system or build new systems, um, you know, to really take this into account. And I think that's, that is, uh, yeah. So ultimately uh, concluding with, we need to treat people better than our data. Um, and then I will happily take any questions. Thank you so much for that, really, for all of that information and that talk. Um, I'm gonna stop recording and then I will open up the floor for, yeah, uh, questions. If people, um, yeah, if people have questions, please type in um, to the chat and we can get to those.